Hi, good afternoon. Thank you all for coming. God, there's so many of you. I'm super excited to be here and even more terrified. And I come here today to talk to you about quests, nonlinear narratives, and how we managed to put all of them into Horizon Zero Dawn. Now, for those of you who might not know, Horizon Zero Dawn is an open world action role playing game exclusive for the PlayStation 4. It is set in a lush post post apocalyptic world where gigantic machines have taken over and humanity is no longer the dominant species. This talk will be composed of two parts. First, I will delve into our research into quests, linear and nonlinear narratives, quest systems, quest building methods uh, in already existing games. In the second part, I will talk more about how this research led us to the development of our own systems and methods and what exactly they are. Now, I know it might be a little bit unorthodox for an engineer to speak at this specific summit, but I think there's a good enough reason for that. And uh, first of all, although right now I'm employed as a programmer at Guerrilla Games, um, my background is a little bit more diverse. I used to work in a web company where I had dual responsibilities designer, uh, where I also worked on narrative and quest systems, and before that I had probably one of the best jobs possible, which was being a professional game or dungeon master. <laughs> Secondly, I kind of hope that an engineer might bring a little bit of a different perspective to the common issues that we as game developers face regarding build, uh, building game narratives and narratives, narrative based games. And se thirdly, quests are a very interesting concept in themselves. And by quest, I'll be talking about the, con the things which you might find in role-playing games, not necessarily what might you might encounter in literary studies, although these two th tend to be closely related. Now, as some of you might be aware, there are two perspectives from which one can look at video games. One is the narrative perspective, which understands a game as a form of a narrative. Second is the ludic perspective, which understands the game as a set of rules. Now, Quest has been proposed as this way to combine these two perspectives into a single concept. And that is partly because to exist, they need both. And to, I allow myself to quote Jeff Howard from his really cool book, Quests, which treats exactly about this topic. Quests are about action that is meaningful to a player on a level of ideas, personal ambitions, benefit to society, and spiritual authenticity. And the word meaningful is exceptionally important here because it also refers to the concept of meaningful choice, which is one of the most important ideas in good game design. The meaning of quests emerges from strategic actions, but these actions have thematic, narrative, and personal implications. Through quests, the player interacts with both the rules and the narrative and draws meaning from both of them. So to summarize all that, quests are this place in a video game where game design, writing, and technology all come together. <laughs> so to be, able to, discuss, to, to be able to discuss this topic, uh, let's have a quick look at a structure of a typical quest. Quests are usually composed of multiple discrete phases or steps. Quests usually follow this typical structure of having an obvious start, obvious middle, and obvious end. Each step of a quest can be considered a single piece of a greater quest narrative. Often, a step is connected with a quest log entry, which informs the player about their progress so far, and forms also sort of a written narrative of the player's personal progression through that quest. Also, a quest step can be con connected to one or multiple objectives, which inform the player about the tasks at hand. And usually, progressing through a quest yields some sort of a reward, which has a tangible value in the context of the game. So if we have a game which story is told mainly through quests, we will need a system which will allow for creation and management of that quest. And the shape of that system, its structure, how it functions, and most importantly, how we understand it, has far-reaching implications into what kind of quests we can build, and by turn, what kind of stories we can tell. So as some of you might be aware, Guerrilla Games used to specialize in first-person shooters and action games in general. So when we, when we set out to, to build Horizon, we had nothing of this sort. So in order to fill the gaps in our knowledge, we decided to look at games that came before and also have a look at how other teams have approached this particular problem. And when looking during pre-production at various games, we found multiple, multiple, multiple very different approaches, but all of them could have all of them had this common denominator. And that was that all of them could have been placed on a scale which describes how flexible they are and how strictly they define what the quest in the context of a particular game is. 
with systems that we could call relaxed on one extreme of that scale and systems that we could call strict on the opposite extreme of that scale. So, what is a relaxed quest system? Well, at its extreme, it's a no system at all, meaning it has no centralized way of managing quests and their progression. It even doesn't have a defined concept of a quest. And any logic that exists to drive a gameplay forward is implemented by the designers directly into the scripting language of a game engine used. Because such an approach doesn't put any limitations on us, in theory, any kind of story that can be expressed through a quest is possible. However, this does come as a great cost uh, of complexity and high time of implementation. So, in theory, we could create intricate stories which use sophisticated storytelling story techniques, which do use complex structures, but these kind of quests would be also very complicated to create. However, these kind of systems have been used very successfully, uh, especially in the early days of computer role-playing game uh, development. So we're talking about games like Might and Magic or Wizardry. But also recently, a lot of role-playing games built on top of RPG Maker platform also use this method, partly because the RPG Maker doesn't seem to support a system of its sort out of the box. So, on the opposite extreme of the scale, we have a strict quest system, and it's sort of a negative of a relaxed one, meaning it does use a single centralized way of managing all quests and their progression, meaning each quest has a defined, strictly defined, rigid structure. And any gameplay that exists during, in this game and is based upon quest is not scripted out by the designers, but built from predefined elements. And as you can imagine, such systems severely limit what kind of quests can be created. However, it does have a positive impact on the complexity of implementation, time of implementation, and actually also communication and cooperation between teams. Because everybody involved in building quests has the same idea of what a quest is, how it's structured, and how it should function. And such systems have also been very successfully used, mostly though in hack and slash games, which are known for their mechanical depth rather than a narrative depth. So we're talking about games like Titan Quest or Sacred. Nowadays, it's actually quite rare to find a game which uses a system on what exists on any extreme of, of that scale. And that is because our audiences over time has, have started to demand more intricate stories and also more sheer amount of content. So most teams trying to, are trying to find this middle ground, this middle of, explore this middle of the scale to find this perfect balance between story complexity, freedom of expression, but also scalability and development time. So, if you were to put uh, the games that we looked during pre-production of Horizon on a graph that represents that scale, it would look something like that. So, on the right-hand uh, extreme, on the relaxed side, we would have older RPGs, like Vampire of the Masquerade Redemption or Gothic, and also RPG Maker-based games. On the left-hand, stricter side, we would have games like the Sacred or Titan Quest, the mentioned hack and slash games. And somewhere in the middle, exploring this mentioned perfect balance would be modern RPGs, like the Elder Scrolls V, Skyrim, or The Witcher 2. The other thing worth looking at is how do we actually merge rules with a narrative to create quests? Well, there are actually two approaches, which seem kind of obvious. First is to write a story, and then by injecting mechanics into it and rules and challenges, add gameplay. Or the other way around, first to create these challenges, rules, and mechanics, and then wrap a story around them. Now, these two methods have been used pretty much ever since we started building narrative-based games, uh, and have been perfected over the years, tend to work well, and have produced magnificent results. However, because we are translating narrative into logic or vice versa, sometimes cracks and inconsistencies can show. So regardless of our best efforts, sometimes we might get a bit of a dissonance between the rules and the narrative. So once we learned all that, we need to decide what our quest system would look like, what kind of stories we would like to tell, and what kind of tools we would need to be able to tell them. So we came up with these four high-level requirements for our quest system and quest building methods. So, first of all, common types of quests must be quick, quick and easy to create. And I think that's very understandable. I mean, in any game, the content which is most common should be the quickest and easiest to create. But 
in Horizon, it had an additional meaning. Horizon Zero Dawn was supposed to be an open world game from the very start. And open world games require a lot of content, a lot of stories to create this feeling of a living, breathing world. Not necessarily complex ones, but still interesting. Secondly, complex quests must not be complex to create and manage. So, Although we were okay with having a lot of relatively simple quests and relatively simple stories, we still want to have this grand narrative, these memorable stories, these quests which embed themselves in the player's imagination and memory forever. So these two couldn't be in conflict. Our ability to create content quickly shouldn't hinder our ability to create intricate quests. Thirdly, focus on nonlinearity. So again, open. Horizon was supposed to be an open world game from the very start. And open world games offer play the players freedom, offer player choice, and ability to approach any problem from multiple angles. And we needed our stories to reinforce these roles, to reinforce this feeling of freedom. Therefore, we needed quests which are non-linear at their base. We needed quests that can be progressed by, by a player from multiple angles and in multiple ways. We needed our system to have non-linearity at its very core. And fourthly, finally, provide a base common language for both the rules and the narrative. So this addresses an is the issue I mentioned earlier of translating the rules into narrative and narrative into rules. And we didn't really set out to solve that particular issue, and I don't think it actually can be fully solved. But we at least wanted to make a one step in the right direction, meaning we at least wanted to give the designers and the writers this ability to have the same set of ideas and same set of concepts in their mind were starting to build quests. So after defining our requirements and after throwing some ideas on how we would approach this particular issue, we decided that our system would live more on the stricter side of that uh, already mentioned scale. And I think that makes sense. Again, we need a lot of content and more rigid structures are good for quick development and really improve good communication and cooperation between all teams. So we knew what we wanted. Now we needed to detail our approach. We noticed that a lot of games, even the, one, the ones which do feature magnificent nonlinear narrative, still construct quests as sequences of steps. So even though the player has the ability to deviate from the written story, they are still faced with a linear script to follow. And we wanted to approach it a little bit differently. We wanted to present the player with a probability space instead of a linear script to follow. So we need a way to visualize our probability space. We need a metaphor that we represent it. And a probability space can be well represented as a graph. So for our first idea was to grab graph theory. So for those who might not know, graph theory is one of the fundamental branches of mathematics and studies the properties of the formal structures that we call graphs. These graphs are understood as networks of points connected by lines. So essentially, graph theory is this formal study of connections between things. However, that would be wonderful if our target audience of these methods were mathematicians and artificial intelligence researchers. But we needed the system to be usable and easily understandable for people who might not have this, this kind of technical knowledge. So we need to look for our metaphor somewhere else. So I went back in memory to the time where I still had this ambition to become a comic book author. And I started trying to remember the techniques and methods of forging stories that I learned back then. And I remembered something that I really liked, which I know as the wall of sticky notes. So what is a wall of sticky notes? Well, quite literally, it is a wall filled with sticky notes. But what is special about this method is that every sticky note represents a single plot point, a single scene, depending on how granular you want to be, in the plot you're trying to create, while the whole wall or the board that you are using is the story that you are trying to write. The other special thing about this method is that the lines that you see between these uh, sticky notes represent the cause and effect relationships between events. That means that the event that is represented by the sticky note where the line starts is the cause of the event represented by the sticky note where the line ends. A simple example. Sticky note one, scene one. The protagonist enters a village. A distressed villager 
approaches them and asks for help, for a horrible menace has, has entered their, their fields and started killing everyone, preventing them from working. Scene one, posted one, the player enters the village and is asked for help. Scene two, sticky note two. The protagonist enters the fields, guns blazing, killing everything that moves, clearing the whole field from the infestation. Battle with the horrible, horrible insects. Scene two, sticky note two. Scene three, sticky note three. The swarm queen, upon realizing that her minions were slain, awakens and engages the player in mortal combat. However, our protagonist emerges victorious. The battle with the swarm queen. Scene three, sticky note three. And our final scene, our final sticky note, the protagonist gloriously returns to the village and gives, well, is given uh, rewards in the form of bags of wheat or something like that. So we have this very simple story, this chain of events, one flowing from the other, connected by cause and effect. And we created a chain, but as you can imagine, a single event doesn't need to cause a single other event. It is absolutely possible to be the cause of multiple. So we can create this sort of a web a cause of cause and effect relationships between plot points. So once we create this uh, web of relationships, we can start writing our story and start um, fleshing out our scenes. So we can either go chronologically or from start to finish, or we can scramble it about and go all Quentin Tarantino on it. But uh, regardless of the methods that we use, when the story is written, we have a very good idea of what event causes which and makes us less likely to have logical plot holes. Well, I really like this method. I figured, hey, let's see what happens. So how did we translate our wall of sticky notes into our quest building method? So we decided to represent a quest as a graph of steps. Each step is a scene or a major event in the greater plot of the quest. Initially, only start steps are available to the player, but as the player progresses through the quest, meaning as the player completes the steps, meaning as the player experiences the scenes defined by the nodes of that graph, different parts of the story open up before them or close. And once the player reaches one of the end steps, meaning experiences one of the end scenes, the quest will end. Now I'll show you a very simple example of how that actually would work. So the player starts the quest by talking to a villager and being asked for help. Now, after that, the start part of that quest is finished, completed, done. However, two options uh, open before the player. In the step A, in our scene A, the player has the ability to go guns blazing into the field and kill everything. Or can uh, instead try to approach the uh, swarm queen and maybe work out some sort of a solution. Now, what is important here is that these two additional steps are possibilities that the player gets. And also, as you can see, there are no lines between them. That means there is no relation between these two steps, meaning the player is absolutely allowed to first talk with a swarm queen and then go into the field kill stuff, or first go guns blazing or, and then decide to talk to with a swarm queen, or can actually ignore any of these branches altogether. However, if the player decides to be aggressive and kill the, on, all the insects, then the option of slaying the swarm queen opens up before them. And now, as you can see, there is a relation between talking with a swarm queen and slaying the swarm queen. That red line represents that if the player experiences the scene in step B, the st step C becomes impossible. It is removed from the plot. It is no longer accessible. That but, what is important, there is no line in the other direction. So the player is still able to talk with the Swarm Queen and then be a douche and kill her. <laughs> but regardless of what we decide, slaying her or talking with her, the option to end the quest opens up before them. So by traveling through this quest graph, the player has a multiple, way to, uh, multiple ways to progress through the quest, and in turn, multiple personal narratives are possible. And all of these possibilities are created just by defining the cause and effect relationships between scenes. So the way this would work in practice is that the writer would imagine this web of possible events where each event unlocks other possible events in consequence creating our probability space, the quest graph. The designer would have the same graph in their head. However, the nodes of that graph would have a very different context, a more rules-focused context. 
But because the initial step would be the same, meaning both the writer and the designer would start out with, with the graph and build on top of it, there would be less translation needed between the roles and the narrative. So now we have a graph, our grand story structure, but how does the player progress it? So each step is understood as a scene, and that scene must have a major verb which defines what action the player needs to perform in order to progress. And sometimes we also define a target of that action. So the player can obtain an item, kill a monster, talk to an NPC, and in our system we supported a finite amount of these verbs. I'll give you two very simple examples of how that would work in progress, uh, in practice. So, the simple scene. The player, after searching through rubble, finally finds and picks up Amulet of Yendor. Plus one for anyone who knows what Amulet of Yendor is. So, the major, po uh, major verb in this scene is pick up, meaning the player takes and puts in their inventory. And the object of that, uh, of that scene, the target of that action, is the Amulet of Yendor. So in game logic, this would translate to obtain, put in inventory, and the game object is Amulet of Yendor. Meaning, once the player obtains, puts in their inventory the Amulet of Yendor, the quest will progress. Second very simple example. In the arena, the player defeats all six opponents. So, the main verb here is defeat, which translates into our game logic to kill. And our six opponents, because we are in an arena, are gladiators, and there are six of them. So once the player kills the sixth gladiator, the quest will progress. So, to summarize all this, quests in Horizon Zero Dawn are built as a graph of steps, possible plot points, which are linked together by cause and effect and defined by actions needed to be performed by the player. So while using our methods, we managed to succeed in some areas and not so much in others. And I would like to tell you about the most interesting cases. So let's talk about the good stuff first. So first of all, the graph structure did indeed assure that we could create naturally and without any hacks or workarounds nonlinear quests, meaning everyone in the team involved in building quests was thinking nonlinearly and it was our main mode of operation. Secondly, having this limited set of verbs which defined actions required to progress the quest made it indeed simple to create our common types of quests. However, because we supported a wide enough variety of these verbs, we didn't hinder our ability to create more sophisticated ones. Another very interesting success that we got, which was actually quite unexpected, was our player jobs. So we noticed that certain simple patterns which use specific verbs recur quite frequently. And because our system was relatively strict, we managed to automate creation of quests based on such patterns. And in the end, this ended up our, our player job system. So we allow the player to generate a quest for themselves during gameplay for certain particular uh, purposes. For example, bartering with a merchant or crafting an item. So the player can choose a recipe, press a button, and that will generate a quest which will guide the player through obtaining all the necessary items and then crafting the item. However, from the perspective of a player, a generated quest and a handcrafted quest are not uh, possible to distinguish. And the most interesting problem that we faced, that I really would like to talk about, is the time travel problem. So, when you read a book, when you watch a movie, when you read a comic book, once a scene occurs, it occur, occurred, right? When, you, uh, when an event happens, it happened. It cannot unhappen, it cannot unoccur. It's there in the timeline forever. It's there written on these pages forever. However, during gameplay, that's not always the case. Sometimes, for the sake of clarity and for the sake of not confusing the player, and sometimes for the sake of streamlining the gameplay, we allow for the story to roll back. We allow the story to go to a previous state. A good example of that happening in Horizon were our bandit camps. So, bandit camps were very simple quests. The player needs to find a bandit camp, the player needs to enter the bandit camp, and the player needs to perform certain activities, activities in that bandit camp, which is usually slaughtering of innocent bandits. Um, and the thing is that because we had this open world and paradigm in our heads and wanted to give player freedom, 
once you enter the bandit camp, it's absolutely possible to leave it. But the story already progressed. According to the plot, according to a quest log, you have entered the bandit camp, kill all the bandits. And leaving made it actually kind of confusing for the player what's next to, to, to happen. So we needed to move the story back one step when the player left, so that from the perspective of the player, they need still to reach that bandit camp and do whatever they need to do. However, because our system was so deeply rooted in a story writing metaphor, that wasn't supported. However, we realized that uh, this is an issue and we are currently working on uh, fixing it in a non-hacky, non-horrible way. We managed to work around the issue in the end, but uh, we still are looking at a very appropriate solution. So to close this up, uh, the system that we created in our method served our purposes quite well. A team that never created a quest-based game before managed to create almost 150 quests of various complexity, and, I've be and as I've been told, some of them actually well, were quite well received. And also we had these unexpected successes of being able to generate these player job, create these player jobs, which is one of the coolest quality of life features that we have. But the system is not perfect, we still need to improve it. So we still need to fix our time travel problem. And uh, the, in the end, the list of the verbs that we had didn't sufficiently meet our needs. Some were made redundant, some, were, were, some of them were overly specific, uh, but we all just need to revise them and everything will be fine. So that's it. That's pretty much how we... <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, if anybody has any questions, uh, I'm cool to answer or something. Two minutes, and so two questions, I guess. Uh, hello. So, have you run into any problems with the completion, uh, completionists? Because uh, in this web of uh, possible actions in your quests, there's always one way to you know, get the most benefit of. And people sometimes will feel like, I'm not playing the game 100% if I don't go through all the possible steps I can, go, I can do a certain quest. Do well, you have any? Well, the idea was to actually not make it not even possible to like, play the quest in all possible ways in one single uh, sitting. But uh, for completion's sakes, um, there were like key points in every quest, like the one of endings or something like that. And these counted to the completion ratio of the whole game. So although we did have nonlinearity, we also had these choke points sometimes for these specific purposes. Uh, yeah. yeah, another question? Yeah, um, just uh, something quite interesting that you mentioned. You mentioned um, a single player action, um, you know, causing uh, and uh, having a causal reaction on multiple threads in a way. And in this complex graph, um, how much interplay is there between the different threads in your graph? And how do you manage that complexity? Because that can easily exponentially, you know, explode. Okay, so uh, the question was, how do we manage actually the complexity that the graph complexity grows exponentially with every node added. But specifically with the interplay of, if there is much interplay between uh, the threads in the quests, if that makes sense. Yeah, essentially, if, if I understand correctly, if mm. there is interpl uh, interplay between certain parts of the quest, how do we manage the complexity of that? Well, we have, we have very good tools. Uh, so essentially we create a specific editor that will allows uh, the designer to see the state of the quest exactly, which nodes are blocked, which are available, which are completed during playthrough of the quest. So by playing a couple of times and seeing how everything lights up and uh, lights, uh, lights down, it's also possible to figure out uh, what, uh, what is not going okay, no, what's not right. Plus we had some debugging tools specific for these purposes. But in the end, uh, nobody created such complicated quests that they were impossible to figure out what's wrong with them. Okay, but th there wasn't that much interplay between quests and, and uh, such, that was the Between question. quests, not so much. Okay, okay. cool, thanks. Okay, thank you. Right. Yeah, uh, if uh, anybody has more questions, I'll be in the wrap-up room, but further away in the corridor. Thank you.